Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this UCL Minds Lunch Hour Lecture. We're pleased to have you all with us today. My name is Ella Metcalf. I'm Deputy Director of UCL's flagship Natural Sciences Programme, which is an exciting three or four year interdisciplinary undergraduate science degree. I'm here to introduce our speaker, Professor Geraint Thomas, who is also the Director of the Natural Sciences Programme. Geraint is Professor of Biochemistry in the Department of Cell and Developmental Biology. He's a skilled scientist with an academic background ranging from chemistry to mathematics, and his group has active collaborations across an array of disciplines, including life sciences, physics, medicine, and chemistry. He's also deeply committed to development of our future scientists. Besides his leading role in the Natural Sciences Programme, Garrett is Deputy Director of the London Interdisciplinary Doctoral Training Programme. This is the Lias Bioresearch Council DTP in the UK. It offers research students the opportunity to pursue innovative multi-specialist projects on topics ranging from DNA nanotechnology to cancer signaling to the modeling of foodborne disease risks. Karen also chairs the Bioresearch Council's People and Talent Strategy Advisory Panel, which addresses the national talent landscape, investment in people, and the needs of user economic communities, including academia and industry. In addition, Garrett leads the Seismic e-training program for bioscience researchers, which he'll tell you about. He's giving us a lecture today with the title, Fat Chance, From Biochemistry to Maths and One Million Pounds in Teaching Income. In his synopsis, Garrett asks, how does a lipid researcher who studies microscopic signaling mechanisms develop a one million pound CPD operation out of a keen side interest in teaching? Professor Thomas will address questions at the end of his lecture, but you can submit your questions at any time during the event. You can use the Slido link that you were sent by email, or if you don't have access to that, you can go to slide.do and enter the code LHL2. Over to you, Geraint. Thank you very much, Ella, for, for that introduction, which I think was, uh, uh, was certainly complete. So the talk, Fat Chance from Biochemistry to Maths and One Million Pound in Teaching Income. Uh, well, what I'll focus on is not some esoteric talk on my research uh, filled with arcane language and complicated concepts whose primary purpose will be to keep me in a very agreeable comfort zone, uh, in which I'm the expert. It's a chance to make a fool of myself because a willingness to do that is the basis for learning as far as I'm concerned, and certainly the basis for going the extra mile for interdisciplinarity, uh, which will be a theme for today. Uh, so the aim of UCL Minds from the publicity is to share knowledge, insights and ideas from our UCL community, uh, and that's exactly my aim, rather than detailed research. So one way of setting up where I want to go is to tell you a little bit about my own journey, how did I get here, and why this influences what I do and what I'd like to do next, and my thoughts about the future. So. A first a frame, universities are ecosystems of interests and talent and potential, blending research and teaching. Uh, the funds and other, other resources all get blended too. Small and large research infrastructure supports advanced uh, undergraduate projects and master's projects. And university faculty positions and underpinning business cases are predicated on the supply of teaching, mostly to undergraduate students. And we live in unique spaces you know, in, in unique spaces in our system. And the real costs of research are subsidized by teaching, but it's not always clear how the real costs of teaching are met by research, except in maintaining an environment where it's easy for those who teach to stay current with minimum optimized effort, and those who organize teaching to keep modules and courses current by brokering the contribution of experts to our curricula. So time spent on teaching, that's all aspects, planning, administration, creation, delivery, follow-up, maintenance, assessment, progression, and repeating that whole process can't be spent on research, and the blend can often lead to unproductive fragmentation uh, for the lives of university researchers and, and teachers and academics. Yet for me, by getting involved in everything the university does, I've been trying to mine everything in our academic community for everything that it can do. It's been more than just making myself useful. I've actually been on a marvelous journey. Having attempted to consume as much of the university experience and opportunity as possible, I'm hypersensitive to a great polarization. Some academics, sometimes a lot, in many universities around the globe, have a proxy measure of their value and, their, and for their success. 
They quantify how little teaching they are obliged to do. It emphasizes their research prowess and leadership. This is true even though teaching, as I said, subsidizes research at universities. They would rather behave as if they are in some sort of research-only institute without having to shoulder the job insecurity or other risks of working in, in institutes like that. I've not lent on these colleagues at uh, mine and other universities uh, as my examples. Rather, I thought about the careers of people like Bertrand Russell, whose biography describes his university job starting with his requirement to first create a portfolio of 20 lectures before he then got to get on with anything else. I also think about Andrew Huxley, you know, a figure in living memory of people still associated with the college. While at UCL, he taught large first year classes amongst other classes, and he marked exam papers and essays. But he was also simultaneously head of department, a Nobel laureate and president of the Royal Society. We remember him because he fused mathematics, physics, and biology into an explanation of the electrical action potentials in all of our, all of our nerves right now, moving our muscles, conducting our breathing, keeping our hearts beating, our eyes seeing, ears hearing, and brains thinking. With these examples in mind, I'm proud to say that I've concerned myself with the overlap of university teaching and research in sciences, and especially on interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, and multidisciplinary sciences. To make a definition that I, to take a definition that I like of interdisciplinarity, it's in developing the power to view the challenges of one discipline through the eyes of another. Equally importantly, I think, developing the willingness, the ambition to view the challenges of one discipline through the eyes of another is equally the willingness to get on with it. So I first came to UCL to work with Shamshad Cockroft, an already eminent researcher in signaling through phospholipid metabolism. We were very successful and we learned a lot. This was without doubt one of the most exciting and enjoyable periods of my career. I spent many years in cold rooms, those big walk-in fridges that are really cold laboratories. In there, I spent my time isolating trace amounts of proteins and through them understanding new aspects of the metabolism of lipids. I was especially interested in the power they possess through their metabolism, through the metabolism of these exotic biochemicals uh, to control fundamental processes of our lives from moment to moment. And they've controlled these fundamental processes uh, of the lives of all of our ancestors back to the origin of life on Earth 3.5 billion years ago, only one billion years after the planet formed. It's lipids that form the membranes that define the boundaries of all cells. Without these boundaries, there would be no cells. And without cells, there is no life. Cells are the fundamental particles of life. Nothing smaller is alive. Everything larger is made from collecting cells together. Cells theory, theory is the other great biological theory alongside the theory of evolution. And cells are what evolution ultimately acts on. Lipids are the fatty substances of our bodies, those bits of living cells and tissues that won't dissolve in water. They're as fundamental to the origin and maintenance of life um, over unfathomable stretches of time as nucleic acids like DNA or proteins. But they are much, much more difficult to study. Mostly they occupy a two-dimensional world in which transient nanoscopic features can emerge from chaos and fade away. They're more governed by the rules of physics than the rules of biology. Most move around a great deal and they're usually too small and chemically simple to modify and tag without changing their nature and behavior fundamentally. I would argue that the reason why lipids remain comparatively understudied compared to DNA, RNA and proteins is principally because they are so much harder uh, to work with, except when you study them in general terms in large numbers. Even today, much of what is said about lipids is projected from experiments done when proteins that interact with lipids are inferred uh, or their properties are inferred from those interactions. And it's the proteins that are actually analyzed as proxies, one removed from the real object. What I realized was that to study lipids and membranes, you need to come at them from a lot of different angles at the same time. 
various branches of biology, biochemistry, physiology, genetics, or from chemistry, physical chemistry, organic chemistry, or from physics when you're thinking about electrical properties or soft matter physics, or you're thinking about analytical methods, they all have to be combined to work in this realm. So if you're going to work with lipids, then you either need an interdisciplinary mindset or you need to develop one. For example, this image on the left-hand side of this screen here shows the, uh, the appearance over time of touring light patterns in an active media. This is essentially a flat layer of, uh, of lipids that are being acted on by two different enzymes at the same time, causing a lipid to appear and disappear. What we find is, is they aggregate into these patterns that change over time. And whether you end up over here on the left-hand side if, when the patterns collapse or over here on the right-hand side depends on simple things like how small the container is in which this reaction is constrained. Truly a strange world far removed from what we generally think of uh, as biology. Now, getting into lipids and studying their signaling wasn't my first encounter with, uh, with some of uh, with interdisciplinary ways of thinking. You know, I'd unhelpfully requested in my PhD that I not only be allowed to stick living cells into the chemistry department's NMR spectrometers, but those spectrometers also be retuned to exotic nuclei like lithium so that I could determine the true concentrations of this ion inside cells and they were bathed in dilute solutions of lithium salts. This approach came on the back of 18 months work as an interloper in the organic chemistry labs, synthesizing novel compounds with which to investigate key enzymes in a lipid, in a lipid metabolic cycle that was profoundly inhibited by lithium ions. The inhibition of this cycle was thought to be the locus for lithium's profound impact on the symptoms of bipolar disorder. And by combining this chemistry, biochemistry as well, into a simple mathematical model, taking those measurements from the spectrometers and measurements of enzyme activities, I convinced myself that this metabolic cycle is unlikely to be the point of action in the way that it was hypothesized. Many years of drug development by companies uh, have essentially proved the point as they sought for a patentable lithium alternative based on inhibiting the enzyme using the same mechanism of inhibition. And they fail to produce anything of value. They might have the right molecular, they have the right molecular mechanism, but the drugs don't work. However, I think the colleagues at UCL may have stumbled on a more likely mechanism based on this cycle, but unfortunately, this has never been published following the untimely death of a colleague a few years ago. But I hope to see that puzzle solved one day. And so my title then is a pun on lipids. It's what it gives part of my title today. And I promised myself years ago that if I was ever invited to give a lunch, a lunch hour lecture, that I would somehow find a way to put fat chance into the title. And so here it is, uh, here it is today. However, despite all of that work, hard work on lipid signaling and signal transduction, two things happened to me that I found frustrating or disappointing. Firstly, through my studies of what controlled crucial lipid metabolism involved in transmitting signals within cells, I encountered the baffling world of protein structure. I'll say more about that in a minute. It was baffling because I had no tra training in this area. Here, down on the left-hand side, you can see one of the products of all of those years in a cold room, a protein whose structure we determined after crystallizing it. We were beaten to the punch uh, by a paper that appeared slightly earlier in Nature, uh, getting the same structure, except that their claim to novelty turned out to be wrong. Uh, and thus, uh, they, while they had a scoop, they probably had one at the same time for some of the wrong reasons. But in understanding how we determine structures like this, biologists have to go into a completely different realm from which we're not normally trained. The other thing that happened to me is that I became uh, tired of a sort of way of thinking and communicating about, uh, about signal transduction and signaling processes in cells. A sort of, here's the model, uh, chalk and talk meeting in which various three letter abbreviations would be joined to each other by arrows. And this was expected to tell us about biology. So here on the right hand side is just such a diagram, three letter abbreviations connected by arrows. And this is supposed to be how information flows through our cells. 
but I can have a sense, profound sense of dissatisfaction here because you know, even though I've worked on this enzyme, this enzyme, some of these, I'm working on this one over here, and all of these interact in some way with lipids and they metabolize them and turn them into messages or they, are, they feel these are the sensors of changes in what lipids are doing. It came to me that, you know, I came to be unhappy with the fact that this isn't dynamic, that it's fixed. I also became unhappy with the idea, with realizing that some of these arrows are geneticists' arrows from evidence obtained in one way, and others are biochemists' arrows from evidence obtained in another way. And what I couldn't figure out is this, are these really wiring diagrams, or are they just collections of potential interactions? And do all these things happen in all cells at the same time, or is it highly selective? And because not all of these proteins are present in the same time, at the same time or in, in abundances needed to have an impact. And then I had the good fortune to spend a couple of years in Harvard Medical School, where I first began to get a hold of uh, ideas about how I might uh, end some of this dissatisfaction. So what happened is that when I got to Harvard, I had the good fortune to share a lab bench uh, with this uh, fellow here, Michael B. Yaffe. Uh, here he is shown dressed up in his, uh, in his surgical outfit because he was not only uh, a trauma surgeon in Boston, which means a lot of gunshot wounds amongst, uh, amongst other things, uh, when he wasn't researching at the bench alongside me, also on signal transduction, this was his other job. But before that, uh, Mike, had, uh, Mike had done other things before he went to medical school. Now, one of the things we talked about was that he'd spotted, knowing us from London, that there seemed to be a course running through the web on the principles of protein structure from an institution called Birkbeck College. And he wanted to know a bit about it because there wasn't an equivalent course in the US. And the fact that it was available through the web um, was new and it was massively innovated. And of course, he could study it from the, from the east coast of the US. Now, importantly, um, what went alongside the principle of protein structure course was a course called uh, Principles of X-ray Crystallography. And triggered by Mike's attention to this, I decided that I would study both courses when I came back to, back to London. Now, the thing about protein structure and X-ray crystallography is that it's physical chemistry. And you need an awful lot of mathematics to be able to, uh, if you want to do this properly, but even to study it, you need to think in terms of inverse lattices in inverse spaces and symmetries and Fourier analysis and synthesis. And for me, this was a gateway to mathematics in a context directly linked to my research. The other thing is that Mike had been an engineer when he was first at university, and he clued me into the fact that engineers had quite well-developed mathematics for thinking about interactions of parts like, spring by, like springs and masses and things that vibrate and oscillate through things called systems of differential equations. And that piqued my interest, and I realized that these were also in use inside biochemistry and could possibly answer some of my dissatisfaction about the dynamics, dynamics in the networks, the signaling networks of the sort that I just sh showed you. So maybe this was a way um, to, uh, mathematics would be a way to get into more deeply into the biology I was interested in and, uh, uh, and to carry my, uh, my research forward and to overcome my, my dissatisfaction. Now, maths had languages and methods for dealing with almost all of the problems uh, that I was interested in. We were in an, a an age where the genome, the human first drafts of the human genome were completed, and we were pretty much feeling that that uh, part of biology was over, and we were now moving on to systems. Simultaneously, the same notion was occurring to others uh, at the same time, so I felt like I was going with the tide. You know, the, with molecular and cellular biological research, the problem was that cellular and molecular biology research through the late 80s and the 90s, uh, in its aggressive headlong rush into uh, molecular botanizing and atomistic uh, reductionism uh, through cloning everything and re-expressing everything and looking at, at parts of cells and signaling one molecule at a time, we wiped out all of the resource and know-how we pretty much had in terms of systems biochemical thinking. Because if you didn't do molecular biology of this aggressive sort, 
then you weren't winning grants for about 15 years. Now, I didn't know whether it was possible for me to engage with mathematics in any uh, realistic or productive way. Um, I had only rudimentary maths, so I spent some time sitting down at my dinner table in Boston, uh, refreshing some algebra and working through a big book on calculus problems. And when I was, uh, when I was happy that uh, there was something for me to do, and when I'd finished my principles of protein structure, the next step for me was to revisit my youth to some extent. Here's a picture of the sort of TV that used to be on in the middle of the night from the Open University. And it was to the Open University that I turned for further work in developing my insights, my skills in mathematics. It's amazing exactly how much work, how much mathematics you can get done when you've got 45 minutes in the morning and 45 minutes in the evening traveling on the Metropolitan Line over six years. And I plowed through an awful lot of study, some of it relevant to biology, most of it not, but with my antenna always twitching for where I could apply it and laid down a foundation of skills in which I could use to approach biological problems in a mathematical and importantly in a computational way, because this training also showed me the power of computers uh, to aggress at least applied mathematical problems, if not also to gain intuition about pure mathematical problems. And from this, I gradually built up a relationship with students in UCL's complex program, uh, starting off with small six-week projects, eventually summer projects, until some of these fantastic students became my own PhD students, and we were able to work on, uh, hard on mathematical approaches, statistical approaches, and computational approaches to biosciences. So this is where the other bit of my story comes from. But I also decided to feed back what I was learning in mathematics for my research back into, um, back into my teaching. I'd taken an interest in teaching uh, uh, in my own courses in 1999, and I'd right from the start relied heavily on computers. And I received recognition for pioneering, pioneering the use of virtual learning environments uh, in, the, uh, uh, in biological sciences, in, and especially then uh, in what would go on to form the bio, uh, bio, uh, biosciences, the division of biosciences. But what I'd learned besides the contents of these courses was also the fantastic power of first class distance learning materials and how hard uh, and how hard it was to create these materials. We all tell ourselves now in this pandemic uh, that during this, uh, this new ways of working, we've become the open university overnight, but we haven't. We're not anywhere near their quality management standard. Our student body is much more homogeneous in its academic standards and much less heterogeneous in almost all dimensions of diversity. Our talk now about the future way of running the university teaching operation is about what we'll bring back with us from our little sojourn into OU territory. And everybody hates a tourist. But this link into teaching and learning is important. I'd gone into this hard work thinking it would pay off in research, but it turned out I wasn't being imaginative enough. Turns out that as a result of doing all that work with VLEs early in biosciences and building connections to people interested in how teaching works through the old CAL setup, the precursor of UCL Arena, and taking an interest in their people and what they do and that at a crucial moment, an opportunity passed under my nose. And from this opportunity sprang a strategy to apply all of this, uh, what I'd learned about how to teach, but also what might be useful to bioscientists to empower researchers through training aimed directly at them. And this then brings us to the seismic story. What happened was the uh, BBSRC, the big bioscience and bio biotechnology and bio biological sciences engine and research council, put up a million pounds in a competition for anybody who can propose how to upskill their research workforce in mathematical, computational and statistical approaches to research. Now, the thing was that anyone hoping to win this competition would be up against, up against six already established centers of systems biology research excellence that were sponsored by the same funder at universities equally well competent in teaching as well as they were in research. 
There are also plenty of other com competent centers funded by other means. For example, UCL's complex, which I've already mentioned. It would be tough to win this competition. I remember the briefing meeting. There were some formid formidable figures in attendance. So I responded by creating a consortium that would directly answer the call and hopefully take the incumbents entirely by surprise. Combining the quality uh, um, and the strengths and leadership in distance learning and e-learning on difficult materials from the OU and Birkbeck with informatics expertise from Edinburgh and Complex's capability in me meshing maths and computing with biosciences, we decided to have a go. You should remember that we were proposing something that was e-learning driven, and this is all entirely before the advent of MOOCs. But we've been able to be successful We've remained autonomous and we live by the fees that we earn today. And it's a, and I introduce you, I think, to some of the people involved here. Uh, Uwe, Uwe Grimm, David Morse, David Crow, all from the Open University, Stephen Gilmore from Edinburgh, Adrian Shepherd from Birkbeck. And also Chris Barnes, Phil Lewis, and Nadine Mog Mogford, who were the original team uh, recruited uh, to deliver this and are all still at UCL. And also Gerald Bayer, who joined the team, Hannah Heaven, and Poria Hadjabagiri, uh, who uh, now left the team, but is responsible for the UK government's coronavirus dashboard from which all of our information comes for our news broadcasts on exactly what's happening uh, from day to day. Uh, during the pandemic. That's the quality of people who we could get to work on this project. So we had a million pounds from the original grant uh, and a little bit more from uh, institutional inputs. Uh, and we've earned over a million pounds in fee income after the grant ended at the start of 2017. And we've more than one million if, in income if we count the small additional grants that we've uh, added on top. And recently, we've just been awarded um, uh, further funding uh, to uh, to drive our uh, drive our activities forward. I'll take that back for a moment. Further funding to to draw out, drive our activities forward. But first, to just drive home how much of a success this has been. This is what a thousand people looks like. This is a hall with a thousand people sitting in it, and this is a hall with three thousand people sitting in it. And the seismic program has engaged with 3,000 researchers uh, in the years that it's been running. And just to get to the million pound point again, that's what a million pounds look like, looks like in an easy to carry, uh, uh, easy to carry bag, which unfortunately UCL uh, does not allow me to, uh, to have access to. But as I said recently, We've just been awarded another three quarters of a million pound for a project called Learn to Discover, funded by the Innovation Scholars Data Science Training in Health and Biosciences competition. And L2D will unite some of the players from Seismic, people from UCL and Birkbeck, and some of the team members and colleagues for other new team members from across UCL Biosciences, Faculty of Life Sciences, and the UCL Research IT Services, uh, Research Services to deliver e-learning in data sciences and machine learning and AI approaches to problems in biosciences and health. I think that we could learn from L2D about delivering data sciences training uh, at a distance, could have much wider implications and create surprising opportunities for collaboration in training well beyond the realms of biological and health sciences. And indeed, only this morning, I've had a conversation about how to reach different communities from our platform of knowledge that we will be building. You know, it's true that it used to be physics that was the queen of data intensive sciences, and now it's biology. Generating hard to handle data is not, is not hard in biology because of its sheer complexity. And there are plenty of other realms in which a large amount of complicated data is being generated all the time all the way from the production of uh, high value biologics like the vaccines we're using now to battery technology. There is a much, much wider uh, constituency for competent data, data use than just biosciences. But having taken the plunge and broken into interdisciplinary ways of thinking, I didn't stop there. I found that once I was comfortable with ignorance and happy and happy to demonstrate it, 
But to couple that with curiosity uh, and that I found that I could let my professional ego uh, put it down on one side, then the interdisciplinary ways of working became addictive. So curiosity is critical. Curiosity is an interesting interest leading to inquiry. And research is inquiry, investigation, or experimentation aimed at the discovery and interpretation of facts, revision of accepted theories or laws in the light of new facts, or the practical application of new or revised theories or laws. And those are two definitions of curiosity and research. And I find that they combine naturally. Essentially, that is that in a university like UCL and also much more widely, there is room for almost a hobbyist approach to professional science and research. There is room for intellectual bricolage. Bricolage is the construction or creation from a diverse range of available things. Construction like a sculpture or a structure of ideas achieved by using whatever comes to hand. The process of improvisation in human endeavor. And for me, this is the core of interdisciplinary working. It's the connection between curiosity, research, and this bricolage approach. I can take what I need to stay focused on the problem. And that's the key to stay focused on the problem. So what sort of problems am I getting into? Well, yes, maths and computing are statistical approaches are lacking from bio-oriented bio research. And there's a problem because once you know uh, once you start to understand how to handle data, it starts to change how you collect data and what you're interested in collecting data from. And this will bring me eventually to the problem, which I'll close with, of who does the hard work of getting interdisciplinary work going and making things happen. For me, I choose to look in the mirror. There's at least one guy in there who can get involved. And that guy can also access resources and recruit excellent people to help. For example, talented or ambitious PhD students and undergraduates. And here are some of the few examples of where we've been going together in our interdisciplinary quest. On the left is something that's a so-called hyperspectral data cube in which we take images, chemical images of tissues that may be diseased or healthy. And at every pixel, we obtain a spectrum. And we try to interpret this hyperspectral data set to make claims about diagnosis of health uh, or disease. We probed into problems about uh, that connect to the heart of the pathology industry, for want of a better word, the, the production of samples uh, for diagnosis um, from the sectioning of tissues is almost entirely uncontrolled for quality purposes. And there are significant problems in understanding whether diagnosis is reliable. And we've also, as I said, been pitching into trying to pick apart finding different pieces of tissue that are diseased and then subclassifying those diseases. I've also been working with uh, scientists whose training comes from CERN and from particle and uh, particle physics, for example, genetic micro devices. We were trying to apply the general principles of, uh, of uh, physics that send beams of protons circulating around bits of Switzerland, Italy and France and colliding with each other and to apply them on a smaller scale to make uh, devices that can separate femto femtomolar amounts uh, of biological materials and then collide them with each other and then see how they interact or collide them in a way that we diagnose diagnostic uh, and allow us to track down biomarkers. When you've got your interdisciplinary mind open, you can pick up contacts, for example, with Santorini Scientific. This organization with whom we're working wishes to bioprint a uh, transplantable heart. I want to understand in order to get to this big ambition, how and what are the fundamental biochemical and physical and cellular physical processes that they will need to contend with. Working with biosensors beyond border, we take some of our techniques and are attempting to apply them uh, to find useful ways that can be used from diagnosis from multiple biomarkers a long way from big sources, uh, from big research or biomedical institutes. On top of that, with an open mind in interdisciplinary work, I've been able to become involved in the uh, Lido London Interdisciplinary Doctoral Programme as Deputy Director. 
And this is now the largest BBSRC funded uh, uh, PhD program uh, in the country. Similarly, um, it's allowed me to interact with Unilever and their big doctoral training program uh, because of this interdisciplinarity again. And I'll close, but I'll say a little bit now about recent work with, uh, with the UK uh, Food System CDT, but I'll expand on that a little bit later. So this isn't easy to do. I think one of the problems is that we emphasize in our reward structure in universities, uh, our reward structure is largely based on uh, publishing for the library, essentially publishing for our professional peers. Uh, after all, they write the promotion references and they award the honors and the medals. And so sometimes there's not much reward because there's not much visibility in getting involved in interdisciplinary research or even teaching. So I think it's useful for universities to ask if, despite our documentation and frameworks for recognition, advancement and resourcing, if our cultures are fully supporters of this way of working. And lastly, I'd like to say one thing and that the principles that I've learned about interdisciplinarity and how to foster it uh, also have their impact at undergraduate level. Uh, as Ella mentioned, I'm also proud to be the director of UCL's Natural Sciences Programme, the college's flagship interdisciplinary science degree and one of the small system of interdisciplinary degree programs that I think are cradles for some of what will be the most conspicuous talent of the future. Don't just take my word for it. There are now an alliance of 15 universities that offer modern natural sciences program at the UK, working collectively to expand the know-how for teaching, learning and researching in this way and to establish standards and expectations that students and employers can rely on in these interdisciplinary programs and to lobby for the resources and elbow room needed at universities and beyond to make interdisciplinary science education work. Together we founded the Society for Natural Sciences and I'm also very proud to be one of the three founding trustees. So is this worth all the effort? Well, yes, I think it is for a number of different reasons, both uh, local and national. So, for example, here's some information I pulled together by looking at UCL's education strategy, the current one, and its research strategy uh, refreshed in 2019. And what do we find? Well, if we look for key words like student, education, learning, research, strategy, things like this, everything to do with our core business, we get hundreds of mentions for students in education and learning and strategy and research under the education strategy. And we get similarly large numbers for uh, when we look at the, at the research strategy uh, as well. But importantly, we find the middle level of, uh, of visibility to do with either digital approaches, sympathetic to things like seismic, for example, but also is it interdisciplinarity uh, or interdisciplinary uh, and uh, any mention of across disciplines or cross disciplinary or disciplinarity. When you look in this zone, what you find is again, a very high frequency of mentions proportional to the number of uh, the mentions of these other topics. When you look at disciplinary uh, emphasis in these strategies, you find that the numbers are relatively small, uh, especially in the teaching strategy. And in the research strategy, you find out that the mentions of specific disciplines is just about total, all of them, the same number of, men the number of mentions for cross-disciplinary or interdisciplinary. So this tells me that at our strategy level, this interdisciplinary approach or cross-disciplinarity is emphasized. But it's not just here. So for example, if you look at the UK's government's research and development roadmap, uh, summer 2020, uh, you'll find that they want to build a vibrant ecosystem of institutions. And in this ecosystem of institutions, they want transformational opportunities along and to break down barriers to interdisciplinary research. They want to support allied research that can help tackle the most complex and pressing challenges of government, and they want to remove barriers to interdisciplinary research. The flagship uh, Future Leader Fellows, uh, the back program that backs the winners of the future, uh, hopefully the winners of the futures, they want to make sure that they can break down the barriers to novel uh, in such a way that novel interdisciplinary projects can flourish under the leadership of these fellows. 
And lastly, they have UKRI as the big fun, biggest funder of recent in the UK government to do ambitious interdisciplinary research. And when you look at the surveys from which all of this input came, what you find is, is that there's a, a significant interest in the community uh, in finding a number of ways to support interdisciplinary research institutes. You look further through the document and they're looking for high, what respondees highlighted the funding for long-term secondments to be a mechanism to promote interdisciplinarity, interdisciplinary approaches. And also the increasing the interaction and mobility between industry and academia via interdisciplinary institutions was considered vital to support the effective application of new research and to strengthen our infrastructure. So why is this important? Well, this is a slide that I like to show to potential natural sciences students, because it seems that STEM, that science, technology, engineering and mathematics disciplines drives growth like nothing else. So here's extracts from a report to the US economy. It says over the last 50 years, that the 5% of people who work in the STEM fields were responsible for 50% of all of the growth in the US economy over that 50 year period. And that's why governments are interested uh, in, should be interested and will be interested, interested in interdisciplinary approaches because they think it will lay big eggs like this. And I'm inclined to agree with them. So what are we really talking about here? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to steal a framework from a friend of mine at AstraZeneca, uh, Dr. John Elvin. And this is that it's okay to think about strong disciplines and uh, with miners drilling down or digging down ever deeper into new knowledge and to understanding what's, what's there. But it's also true that we need bridges. We need people who are scientists who actively seek out ways to connect these together. And I mean active and not passively, just waiting for things to, uh, to fall, in front of, uh, fall in front of them. And I think we need strong disciplines and we need strong and agile interdisciplines. We need to create these bridges. We need staff for both the disciplines and the interdisciplines. And we need researchers for both and we need students for each. And more importantly behind this, or equally importantly, we need challenges for each who bring problems that will only respond uh, to the different ways of working or maybe their collection together. And we'll need them to develop ways of channeling in these challenges to ensure that we have systems to, for encouragement and providing permissions and the means and the resources and the time to respond to these opportunities and challenges. At the moment, I believe that these ways align directly with UCL strategic ambitions. And we've seen some evidence in its statements. But from experience, this way of working always encounters managerial challenge and friction. Very high friction compared to just standard models of working where academics apply for grants and teach undergraduate modules. You know, called modules because administratively, their modular construction and dissemination of knowledge is easy to manage. It is modularized, modularized knowledge, really education in what might really matter for the future. We know that the characteristics sought by consumers of talent uh, and what they are, that there are premiums for curiosity, for cognitive need. We know that there are premiums for emotional resilience and taking responsibility. And this, I think, and there's also premiums for leadership, self-leadership, that is and looking after the growth of your own skills and development and planning and what you're interested in, and also collaborative skills and outlook and organized ways of working. And I think more interdisciplinary approaches, I think that interdisciplinary approaches allow these, those qualities to be generated in abundance. I've got time for colleagues who make the clear point that the need to maintain strong disciplines, and I agree entirely with, it, with them, but I don't agree with the idea that improving and expanding its interdisciplinarity challenges this. However, I don't have time uh, for my colleagues if these opinions come from colleagues who don't teach, or if they do teach, they do it reluctantly. How can somebody really care for, the for their discipline if they don't care for the next generation of those who want to work in it? 
Who would take seriously investment advice from someone who wasn't invested themselves? Free advice is worth exactly what someone has paid for it. We have another problem, and that's to do with the funding of, of the interdisciplinary exercises. Universities like UCL are often dragged around by the funders, and they are the customers, and we configure and reconfigure our staff, infrastructure, and resource to supply their needs as they evolve, and we try to keep up with them. In some cases, universities and departments have been outsourcing their big decisions to funders for years, even letting them make our hiring decisions by backing only those academics who can win independently funded fellowships before we make a commitment. In this way, we avoid taking risks by making decisions based on that prior endorsement. However, we are players in the game, shaping what can be delivered and exerting our own influence. If we weren't, our university would look a bit like this. We'd have a department for EPSRC studies, a department for CRUK studies, an institute of MRC sciences, and probably somewhere a welcome research building. But are these organizations the only customers, especially for the really wicked problems facing us? Are they really capable of behaving and funding in a manner that will really get traction on these enormous problems? Who are the other customers? Should we always respond to calls from priorities from traditional funders, or do we need to look more widely? How can research and education be organized to respond to, to durable challenges with durable centers of excellence? University centers or institutes are often convenient coalitions of the funded, and they melt away when the funding priority changes. How can we be more durable? traditional ways to hitch the business cases for employing researchers to teaching undergraduate students, but then you have to deliver. This is well developed. What else might be done, especially from an interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary point of view? I suggest that we do this by helping to coalesce communities of stakeholders around problems that because of their size or their complexity or both can only respond to interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary approaches. And I believe we should take the lead in figuring out how to do this. How to art find the problems, how to articulate them, how to organize an active search for and to attract challenges of sufficient scale um, so that they then can attract resources. How to help challenge holders drive a problem up the agenda sufficiently far that it can attract resources broadly, not just from one customer like a research council, a charity or a single government department. What do we need to know and learn how to do to make combinations of project challenges, partnerships and alliances essentially oven ready? And what does a beachhead for a successful invasion of a particular challenge look like? What sort of seed investment or seed activity might be used to pump prime uh, in enterprises that might have a big return on the investment of our intellectual uh, uh, capital. And these are all critical questions. And with this in mind, I'd like to draw towards a close by mentioning the UK Food Systems Centre for Doctoral Training. I think there's an angle here. I think that's what's coming together in this project uh, is going to shape my thinking about how we do things in future. This CDT was called for as an interdisciplinary endeavor to fuse social and natural sciences approaches. So that's a big interdisciplinary span. The consortium that won this bid features many established centers for food systems research and is led by the excellent and globally recognized Natural Resources Institute at Greenwich. And as far as I know, this is the only post-92 university that will lead a UKRI CDT. It's an area in which the use in which UCL has no strong coherent association the UCL has a keen interest in uniting its fragmented strengths across many faculties and departments and making a concerted and useful contribution in this realm. I have the habit forming habit of collaboration and being open handed and open eared and I deliver energy and commitment when I sense that the feeling in a project is one of mutual excitement, curiosity and interest. And I think this project is going to help me with some key parts of a puzzle that I wish to tackle. Without joining, un about joining universities to challenges and to the resources to tackle them. Not just tackle them here and now, but create the capacity to keep tackling them by using them to drive research and development programs. The project is innovative because it not only calls for would-be researchers to join the PhD program, but also for stakeholder and problem holders in the food system 
businesses, government, local government, charities, to join the enterprise through a Through Systems Academy that now has 50 members. Not so much to shape the training program, that's innovative enough already, although there will be plenty of room for input, but, to commute, but rather to communicate the priorities and network for solutions and to share the outputs and absorb the talent created. I think there's a model here for what could work more widely. Something that could maybe reverse the polarity of universities responding to funders as customers and universities and their state and stakeholders gathered around them, sourcing the, uh, telling the funders what they should be funding. In, is this a prototype mechanism for which universities to, which universities and problem and challenge holders in any realm can establish the common ground and then seek resources from industry, government departments, UKRI and charity sectors collectively for each other, with each funder bearing part of the burden. I think that is an interesting prospect. And I'd like to close then with my last slide because I think this is important. And this comes uh, from one of the founders of a very famous local company, uh, uh, Google DeepMind, um, that last year pretty much cracked one of the biggest problems and potential opportunities in biosciences the reliable prediction of the structure of proteins from the amino acid sequence alone, essentially opening the way to computer-driven designer life and designer life sciences. So what it says here is that your know, interdisciplinary research is hard. Say you get two world leaders leading, two world leading experts in maths and genomics, then obviously something could cross over, but who is going to do the work to understand, but who is going to do the work to understand the other person's field, their jargon, what their real problem is. Identifying the right question to ask, why that question hasn't been answered and what, uh, and what if it's not been answered, the tricky thing about answering it is. It may seem to outsiders relatively straightforward, but scientists even in the same discipline don't always see their work in the same way. And it's notoriously hard for researchers to add value to other disciplines. It's even harder for researchers to find joint questions that they might answer. My response, as I said before, to who does the hard work? Well, I choose to do it, and I'd encourage many other people as possible to do the same. And with that, uh, I will finish. Thank you, Gary. Lots of food for thought there. And you've had quite a few questions come in already. So I'll just straight away throw one over to you. Um, a question that came in quite early was, do you feel that the college should be actively promoting an open university style approach, um, for example, for staff CPD, uh, particularly in the some relevant, mostly not type approach to CPD? So do you mean uh, we provide it to, sorry, I've still got that dreadful uh, echo uh, here. The, 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 the questions are limited to 160 characters, but I think what this means is encouraging staff to do CPD that isn't just the day-to-day, -day, what they're right. doing think, as part of it, but to, to be think, more wide in terms of their CPD. I think. I think that is absolutely critical. I do, just do not see how you can be an effective teacher if you are not also learning at the same time. You know, I think if you have the habit of studying and learning, it makes you a much better teacher. And therefore, everybody should be learning something, not just through research, which is open-ended inquiry, but through the process of formally well-organized study. So as far as you're concerned, do you think this should be built into uh, into formal sort of management systems for the staff that should be required to do <laughs> some uh, broader CPD as part of the job? I think, uh, I think that it would be important to, uh, I think we could, we could explore that, but I think, uh, and I think you should, have, you should have the opportunity to describe your learning and your, and your uh, attempts to expand, continually expand your, uh, your scope and your range in a formal way. Okay. Next question is, um, how do you think we should improve cross-faculty interdisciplinary working across UCL? So many people have a Python course. Could we just have one really good one? So that, can you give me the last bit again, Ella? So many people have a Python course. 
could we just have one really good one? <laughs> so that there the problem I think is that um, is that people need something like Python for different uses. So for example, I know and we're convinced in seismic that you, the coding, the programming, the problems have to be set in a bioscientist context in order to get bioscientists to take on board that learning and to see the utility quickly. I'm sure it's the same for medics, be the same for physicists, I'm absolutely sure. You need context, the courses could all teach similar materials, but it's the contextualizing that is absolutely critical. And there you need the expert knowledge uh, base to interact to make that work. So some amount of disciplinarity is always going to be necessary. Yes. But once you, what you find is once you've broken through with the tools that you traditionally associate with another discipline, you I, my feeling is and my experience is that you can apply them in a wide range of different settings and it becomes easier and easier to do that. Mm. So perhaps there is room for some cross-pollination of ideas <laughs> between these different courses. I think cross-pollination is right. Um, now the next question is one that I'm sure we've all been thinking it sounds like an extremely exciting career but how does one have the time to be involved in so many projects I have absolutely no idea um, all I know is that it's tiring but it's not exhausting um, I really do not know where the uh, where the time comes from but I think the key is for me and I'm sure it's the same for, any, for many other people. There is always the energy for things that you find exciting. Uh, there is always the energy for things that, uh, that draw your curiosity. You know, it just doesn't feel like work. And I, <laughs> I hope uh, this, I know this is being recorded, but I don't feel like I can not say it. I still remember being stunned the first time somebody paid me for doing research. You know, I could not believe that they hadn't twigged that I wouldn't do it for free. <laughs> and to some extent, there is still, you know, that is still really driving me. You know, it's, um, and that's where the energy comes from in the time. Okay. I guess a follow-on question to that is that you had to be so active in going to so many different places to acquire the knowledge that you needed or the skills, expertise, understanding that you needed for your interdisciplinary research. What's the best way, what advice would you give to um, the next generation if they're seeking this type of educational training? Well, you know, I was, I was really, I was lucky. And if you look back at what, um, at my, if you look backwards on journeys like that, it always looks like there was a plan. It always looks like there was some sort of well thought out track through this. But it never was. It was always opportunities and being uh, awake to opportunities. It was being happy to think about what else might I do and having antennas. I mean, having antenna that were ready to twitch. I've been saying to people for years, and I can't remember where I read it, that I mean, I'm sure it's a piece of popular psychology and a well-reported experiment, that people don't actually, uh, aren't necessarily lucky. If we think of some people being lucky and having things fall in their way and yeah, and whatnot. But it turns out that more often it's people are paying attention. People are looking for opportunities and it's that openness um, and not getting married, I don't think, to somebody else's vision of what your future should look like. But what's in front of me now? What could I do to surprise myself? What could I do to surprise other people? <laughs> I think is a good uh, is a good way to look at it. Okay, so there always is going to be a lot of onus on the individual to move yep. around if they want to be an interdisciplinary scientist. Yep. But again, with that in mind, um, you, there was a discipline, there was a disparity in one of the graphics that you showed in the number of mentions of interdisciplinarity between the research strategies and the education strategies. And um, how do you think we could begin to close that gap? Yeah, I think. I think there was a big, a big difference, um, but I think also the the numbers of the numbers were generally lower for mentioning any of those words in uh, in the teaching and learning strategy. So the proportion was a bit higher than uh, a bit higher than you might think. But I think you're right. I mean, it's it's up to us to. I think we've got enough programs now, and we've got coherence across institutions. 
I think possibly inside the university, it's coherence across the programs and driving those up the agenda. But the thing is, we're, we're the awkward squad. <laughs> we we don't fit well into modular systems of education. We don't fit well into top, up and down means of communications. We're a web, uh, a web of learning and interactions across UCL's knowledge landscape instead of tracks. Uh, and we don't necessarily, haven't organized ourselves necessarily very well to make those systems cohere. But now's the time to push for them, I think. Okay. Um, I think as we've hit the two o'clock mark, we have to bring things to a close. Um, thank you to our audience for coming today and, show, and uh, sharing your thoughts and interest. I'm sure you're all clapping away in your kitchens and bedrooms. Um, you can see upcoming lectures by visiting the UCL Minds webpage, and we hope to welcome you to some of our future events as well. Stay well. <laughs>